to this day, you know, a lot of my family members still don't quite understand the disease, the addiction, and how it affects. But, you know, I think now more than ever, we have to kind of stand together. And I know that there's so many other families out there, even in the Hispanic culture, the Asian culture, Native American culture, we really don't discuss it. I think now is the time to kind of really have those conversations. And we're seeing a lot of that um, because it affects everybody. The disease affects everybody. Welcome to Beyond Theory, a podcast powered by Meadows Behavioral Healthcare that brings you in-depth conversations with firsthand insights from the people on the front lines of mental health and addiction recovery. I'm David Condos, and today's guest is Serenity View's Executive Director, Selena Stockley, who joins me to talk about how family dynamics influence our views of addiction and mental health, and how we can start the honest conversations that inspire recovery. So let's get out of the abstract and see how this applies in the real world. It's time to go beyond theory. Hi, I'm Selena Stockley, and I'm the executive director at Serenity View here in Princeton, Texas. All right, Selena, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good to have you with us. Um, So yeah, we'll start with you kind of introducing us to you and your story and how you came to care about recovery. I know you have you have some family Mm -hmm. uh, history that that led this to be so important to you. So let's start there. Yes. So I have been in the behavioral health field for about 24 years um, in the Texas and Oklahoma market. Um, I started my career in psychiatric services and worked with all ages, um, children and adolescents from ages 4 to 17 and then started working with the adult population and it's a big difference 4 to 17 oh yes yeah. and it definitely teaches you a lot about patients um, and then I started working with the geriatric population which also teaches you a lot about patients um, and then I had the opportunity about three and a half years ago to come to Texas and work in a specialized unit in the addiction recovery realm um, do more of psychiatric services as a secondary and then really work with primary. But and so that was your first kind of foray into the addiction side. Correct. Okay. I had an addiction unit at one of the facilities that I ran in um, central Oklahoma, but this is on you know my first facility at its full scale primary substance abuse. And um, I kind of felt like I was coming back full circle. Um, my A part of my story is that I am an adult child of an alcoholic. Uh, my father um, was an alcoholic for most of my childhood and early adult years. And um, he went into recovery about five years ago. Um, and then, you know, being the daughter of a, a codependent mother. So um, firstborn. Yeah. Um, I so they, was, they were doing a lot of learning on the job absolutely. when you came around. Absolutely. Yeah. And they were very young when they hmm. had me. Um, my parents were in their teens. And so I feel like in some ways we kind of grew up together. But um, it's been an interesting experience and lesson for me coming around um, now, working in primary addiction um, to really understand uh, the disease hmm. and um, kind of how it affects everyone and so those feelings that I had when I was a child um, an adolescent and then a young adult of how I was feeling all makes sense now Hmm. Um, because you know you know what to call it exactly Hmm. and that I'm not crazy or that I am not the only person in the world that feels this way Hmm. Um, so one of the things that I really really um, was very excited about and felt like I finally had my calling and what my um, passion was was understanding you know the disease and um, I feel like coming to Serenity View just kind of made me that well-rounded individual that has a lot of empathy. Um, you know, growing up, you don't know what you don't know as far as what the disease and how it affects and how many layers um, it can have on the family and these feelings of um, hopelessness and shame. Um, you don't know what those are all about. And now that I'm, you know, I work at a facility with amazing people, um, I've gotten a better understanding of it and that I have a lot of empathy. Um, And 
that's really what my passion is, is just to be there for our patients and especially the families. Um, to this day, you know, a lot of my family members still don't quite understand the disease and how it affects. Um, but, you know, as you can see out in the you know, news now and the addiction, the disease has taken so many lives. And um, I think now more than ever, we have to kind of stand together and really support one another and get that education out and let people know that it's okay, that you're not alone, that you can overcome it. It's going to be hard work, but um, there's a community out there that supports you and wants you to be successful. Yeah. And I I just want to back up a little bit because you said your dad, Mm -hmm. you grew up an adult child of an alcoholic now Mm -hmm. um, and you grew up with him having addiction and he just came to recovery five years ago. Yes. Wow. So was that, did you play a role in that or what, what, like what, how did that, what, how would it finally click for him? You know, I think the thing that finally clicked for my father is, you know, my father was a Vietnam vet. Mm -hmm. Um, He experienced so many things um, in Vietnam and he never came back and really processed that, which is a lot of what our military um, and their military, their loved ones are experiencing now, you know, what they go through and the trauma that they go through. Um, Those are things that you just don't come back and sit down with a, you know, with a a two-year-old, a five-year-old and explain. Um, So for my dad, I think it was very much an eye-opener when a lot of his friends who were dying of the disease, you know, cirrhosis of the liver, um, because they came back from Vietnam and they never expressed, they didn't have an outlet and they were drinking to um, hide their pain. And I think that was a really big eye opener. Um, Also, I have a younger sibling. Um, My youngest sister is an alcoholic and um, they have really looked at the disease and how it has affected the family and some of the behaviors that my father had. have now come with my sister, my younger sister. And um, I think that was also an eye opening. So he was kind of getting that outside perspective of, oh, like that's what that looks like to have somebody you love acting that way or making those choices. Right. And, you know, not being able to express his feelings, you know, and then there's the other component too of being in a Hispanic culture, you know, the men are very macho. You don't show emotion, you know, in the Hispanic culture, it's very reserved. Don't ask for help. Don't ask for help because that's a sign of weakness. Um, You know, you're the protector, you take care of your family. Um, And, you know, my, my dad had three girls, you know, And so it was from a relationship level when you have a young father too, you know, how does he relate to girls, you know, to young daughters? You know, my dad was an athlete, um, very well um, rounded, loved by all, loved by many, but his relationship with his daughters was something that just in recent years, you know, we've come to a better understanding and, um, you know, we're in a much better place and, you know, If my father and, you know, my family can really recognize it, I know that there's um, so many other families out there, even in the Hispanic culture, you know, the Asian culture where you don't, Indian culture, Native American culture, where you really don't discuss it. Um, You know, I think now is the time to kind of really have those conversations. And we're seeing a lot of that um, because it affects everybody. The disease affects every race and um, it plays favorites against no one. It, It affects everybody. Yeah. So uh, how do we get there? Like looking at the the cultural piece, Mm -hmm. like who who starts that conversation and kind of kind of starts to make that change? You know, I was thinking about that, especially, um, you know, being part of the Meadows and having such a wonderful, well-rounded reputation and um, a very well respected name in the community of recovery. it's about education and it's about letting people know at a very young age, this is part of life. Um, you know, whether you are a baby boomer, you know, you're, you grow up and, you know, you're not to, to talk about anything that's negative, only talk about positive things. You know, um, if you're sad, you really shouldn't express it. You know, you need to stay strong. People need to see you as a strong person. Um, I think now, And especially as we, you know, we're one big melting pot, you know, um, my kids are biracial, you know, so we are connecting with, with every kind of culture and, you know, and we are a community now that's becoming more diverse. It's okay to have these conversations about, you know, are you feeling sad? Um, how long are you feeling sad? You know, 
not to over market it, you know, and not to really like give someone, you know, the permission to constantly, you know, like, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Mm -hmm. But to, you know, to make it matter, do you, exactly. you want to actually connect? Yeah. I, you know, yeah. yeah, make it connect. You know, we talk to children now, you know, when you're 13, 12 years old, you get your first class in sex education. I think part of that should also be discussing about, you know, moods. Mm -hmm. um, are you sad? You know, um, tell me what it is that you're sad about, you know. Um, also normalizing a little bit that there is no such thing as perfection, you know, that it's okay. Um, you might not be an athlete and you're just as precious and you're just as valuable as someone that's an athlete you know um you might not be a good painter but guess what you might be a great singer you know i mean just embracing but you know it's not that i want everybody to get a trophy you know for participation but just to be able to express because i think that means so much especially as you get into your adult years yeah yeah you know? and so looking at the work you do now. Mm -hmm. uh, I know one of the big pieces of that that you're passionate about is this family yes. piece. So, so you've already touched on it a little bit, um, but could you could you kind of dive a little bit deeper into that concept of family dynamics, uh, the role that codependency can play, and how that kind of kind of have all these ramifications spreading out? Um, absolutely. So one of the things that. I have found, especially working in the addiction component, is that that family piece is so important um, that we don't spend enough time talking about it. And one of the things that we're doing at, at at Serenity is that we are expanding our family education program. And it's our family education weekend where we have three clinicians and um, it's almost a hybrid of sorts where you have family clinicians, a family therapist, and you have um, the leader, um, which is more of the presenter that does the groups, and we have several groups. So when a family member um, admits one of their loved ones, the first thing that happens is a family counselor will make contact with with the family. Making uh, sure they know they're part of it, they're correct, involved. Yeah. That in order for the patient to be successful, it's going to involve them. Um, in the past, you know, it's, I think people have had this, and I knew this when my sister was younger and she was in treatment, you know, um, you're gonna come in for the day and do like a family session. But really understanding what we do at our facility is we talk about the disease, the history of the disease, how the brain functions, um, you know, how dopamine levels affect the brain. Um, but then what the what is the family's role in that? Mm -hmm. Because um, it's been very surprising to me to have a lot of family members that, you know, I want to send my loved one to treatment, get them well, and we'll come visit them at a family session. Mm -hmm. um, but they play like that's a big, not, it's not their job. Right. It's is not the, their job. Kind of the view. Yeah. Um, and it's really surprising to me because, you know, when you have an alcoholic or you have someone, an addict, um, there is nine times out of 10, there is something behind that that has led that person to that behavior. And in, in some in some cases, um, you know, the disease shows itself through a trauma. And um, what I have been really surprised about is how many family members really don't take, like I never drank, my parents never drank, we're not alcoholics, I have no idea where, you know, where where they got this from. Um, and then you really kind of start to find out some of the stories that maybe depression played a big part, um, that there was maybe a, a family secret or two, you know, and um, those things play out. And those things, those secrets, or those things of not really sharing with, with you know, we all know, we have this intuitive sense of what might be going on in a family, but you know, if like we don't talk about it, um, how all of those things can affect the person with the disease. Um, and it's really important that the family members take accountability and have some sense of understanding that they have a role to play in their loved one's disease and how they can help and, and um, how can they look at themselves. Um, so one of the things that we do in our family education program is, you know, the first day and a half is intensive work with just the family. Um, Dr. Kevin McCauley, one of our senior fellows at the Meadows comes in and he presents at our um, family weekends and he really talks to the family about disease and um, the brain and how we take and receive information and it's been really beneficial to the families to have this 
almost an aha moment mm-hmm. of, wow, I didn't think about that. Kind of understanding um, the, the neurobiology, the, yes, the science of it. The so. science of the brain and how did we get to this point. Mm-hmm. Um, then the next day and a half, we bring the, the loved one in that's in treatment. And we do a lot of role playing and we do a lot of, you know, we read cost letters. Um, for us, a cost letter is... Yeah, what, what does that mean? Um, cost letter is what has the disease cost in the family, in the relationship with their loved one. And it could be a cost letter from a father, a mother, sister, brother, wife, spouse, child, uh, grandparent. Um, and it's a really eye opener. It's very hard for our patients, but at some level, um, it's good for our patients because they are now detoxed. They are not consuming and they are not taking type of an altering medication. So where they can hear and process that information. Um, and it's a release for the parents too and the, right. the loved ones. Yeah. But then it's also that release for the patient because the patients also explains and can spend time with the family in a safe environment with counselors to talk about why they didn't really share or why they couldn't come and discuss. And, you know, sometimes it's accountability too on, on the family members. Um, but I have found that to be one of the most beneficial things. It's something that families, um, when we have alumni dinners and we invite all of the family members, um, in November, they've come back to me over and over and have said that the family education program changed their life. You know, their, their loved one had been in treatment numerous times and things have failed, but the family education program was like the final missing piece to the puzzle. And it was an, it was an opportunity for the family to be able to make change and hold themselves accountable and get everyone on the same page exactly yeah. and, and and stay in treatment you know and and go to support groups whether it's al and on um you know and, and get in counseling themselves mm-hmm. you know and it's healthy and i think that's one of the things what you had mentioned about how do we spread this word going to a counselor is okay mm-hmm. you know it's healthy it's good to uh, that's for that's for normal people exactly. that's that's not yeah. only when you're you're yeah, exactly. you know somebody that we don't want to talk about on the corner of the family yeah. absolutely absolutely yeah. it's healthy mm. yeah i know uh, another element of this is how how being in that family how the family dynamic can change our view of what's normal right. like being in that perspective how how do you how do you see that play out and then how do you how do you change that perspective you know um One of my favorite authors is John Bradshaw on Family Secrets. Um, I read that in college and it was one of the things that kind of really kicked in for me was how families, you know, secrets really can hurt a family. And when you don't talk about it, you know, you don't talk about why your father came home really inebriated and, you know, was banging dishes and turning on lights and yelling and screaming at, you know, one in the morning. And that's not normal. Um, but at the same day, you know, I mean, at the same time, you'd wake up in the morning and you're having breakfast and you don't talk about it's it. It's not talked about. No. It never happened, you know. Um, but that still affects you. It does yeah. because you, you know, that's your reality. Like, so you don't talk about things. You don't talk about like what just happened or I don't think that's normal that dads should be coming home, you know, at one in the morning and not calling and being really angry about having to come home, you know, or the things that, you know, happen sometimes when, you know, you've got a young parents that are frustrated and have no idea how to parent and, you know, they're upset about it and they, you know, making statements like, I didn't sign up for this or, you know, I can't wait till everyone's 18 and leaves, you know, I just want to leave, you know, and when you hear those things as a young child, you know, that impacts you. Um, but, um, that's one of the things about working in addiction and working in this field. You get a better understanding and you do get some empathy. Um, but, you know, some of those same things that, you know, like the PM Melody says, some of the some of your biggest woes also you get your biggest strengths from, mm-hmm. you know, they they made you who you are. You know, that's part of that inherent worth. And, you know, they've made an impact on your life. And so, you know, I. I adore my parents. I adore my siblings. Um, I've learned a lot from them. Um, but then I've also learned at my age now that, you know, it's, it's an experience and we should be able to talk about it. And, you know, um, you can grow from it when 
when you talk about it, hmm. not, you know, kind of stuff in those feelings. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's cool. Like you mentioned, John Bradshaw, humility, you were saying before we were recording, um, that, that their teachings meant a lot to you. And that, it's, that's cool to see it come full circle now working at the Meadows and they're, they're yes. kind of part of the Meadows senior fellows. So yeah, that's cool. I know. I just, that's probably been one of my most, um, biggest blessings with working with the Meadows. You know, you read some of these books and you know, you're just, wow, that's pretty cool. And then when you get to meet them and, you know, I didn't get to meet John Bradshaw, but you know, PM Melody, I've gotten to meet her and spend some time with her and, um, it's amazing, you know, just a pioneer and, um, you really relate and it, you know, her teachings has really helped. It's helped me, you know, be a better mother, be a better friend, be a better wife, you know, be a better daughter. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, uh, we'll wrap up with some kind of general bigger picture questions here. Mm-hmm. So, uh, to start that off, what, what would be one piece of, advice, something related to recovery that you've received yourself or something that you, you love to pass on and see really impact people? Um, I would probably say one of the things that, um, has really helped me and I have noticed with my staff and with our patients is that there is no such thing as perfection, you know, and, um, progress progress comes at different times at different moments um and so to never you know um sell yourself short i mean if you can have be in present center i think that's probably one of the biggest things you know be as as a human we are always tending to look at what's going to happen in the future um but you miss a lot of life um And I think one of the things that has really helped me that I've really embraced is that you have to be present center and be in the moment. Um, And that understanding that there is no such thing as perfection. Um, And that this is, you know, your, your life is a canvas and, you know, there are no bad paintings. There are no, you know, you can, you, 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 what you create, you know, it's, it's up to you and you don't have to be what everybody else expects you to be. Um, but you know, when you're a present center and you have the opportunity to just kind of really take a deep breath, um, you realize that, you know, you can regulate yourself and, you know, everything's going to be okay. And, um, the biggest part of coming into treatment is that fear. Um, but it is so important. It is so important that people really look at present center to say where you are at this point right now, is that how you really want to be? Or do you just want to take that leap of faith, you know? And, um, when you can take that leap of faith, things can happen for you if you're just willing to try. Um, And I think that's the biggest thing because people come in with this idea that I'm going to go into recovery. um, I'm going to go into treatment. They're going to dictate everything. I will have no power. Um, I don't want to cry, but I want them. I want to be well and I never want to take a drink again, you know, and um, that's not really how it works. (laughs) It's, it's, it's hard. It's messy, um, but it's worth it. And it requires you to open up. It does. It requires you to, to be, um, true to yourself, you know? Yeah. So. Uh, so then what would be off the top of your, off the top of your mind, what would be one kind of recovery book, recovery resource that, that you keep going back to keep you recommending? Know, um, interesting that you say, um, obviously facing codependency is one of my favorite and, and books. And that's PML Melody, that's which P. you P. mentioned Melody's earlier. Book. No. Um, another one is growing yourself back up which is a great book for an ACOA okay. um, because it's about regulation and it's about your feelings, but growing your, you know, ha- not having these perceptions of what everybody else is thinking. It's about you in the moment. What do you feel and being able to express yourself? So growing yourself back up is a really good book. And then living like you mean it, um, which is what I talked about being present center. Um, we, we grow up with not really, like I had mentioned before about not being able to express your feelings because, you know, you didn't maybe want to upset, you know, the apple cart, you didn't want to upset your parents or your, you know, anyone, um, living like you mean it is about really being in the present and experiencing your feelings and being okay. Um, which also relates to PM Melody's talking boundaries. So then, then just two kind of even bigger picture. 
questions here. Looking at the behavioral health industry, mm-hmm. the treatment industry, what what would be one thing that you would like to change? If you could change one thing, what would it be? Um, it would be that people aren't so quick to just take off mental health off the table. Mm-hmm. Um, working in like certain a, states. The, as a cl- clinician? As well, you know, it, it goes back to... Um, one of the things in certain states, so I've worked in Oklahoma, you know, first things that get cut as a state budgetary oh, okay. is always mental health. Yeah. Um, Texas as well, you know, not recognizing sometimes mental health. Um, we kind of put that aside. You know, we'll treat cancer. We are going to treat, you know, diabetes. Um, but addiction, people still in this world think that it's a choice. It's not a choice. I mean, it's the disease. It's the disease and it's overpowering, it's overwhelming. Um, and um, you just can't turn it off and on and choose to be an alcoholic and choose not to be an alcoholic. You know, um, For me, it would be about people really understanding when you get health insurance, You know, the making sure that there's mental health in there and people talk about it. Um, like we talked a little bit earlier about you know, the things that have happened in our country, especially especially in the last, you know, 96 hours with mass shootings and, you know, the, the talks and the debates about um, gun control and mental health and who has access. You know, at any point in time, you know, it's not just about mental health. I mean, mental health affects everybody and um, it, it spares no expense on age demographic and you know cultural and diversity um but i think what i would really want and what i if i could you know have one wish it would be that we we really talk about mental health and that we provide services um you know for mental health and we make it part of every day um, that we discuss it and we don't discuss it just when there's a crisis um, or when there's something that's tragic, you know, a tragedy has occurred that we talk about it every single day and that it's important that we do, you know, we talk about wellness, health, physical, but that's also part of your mental health too. Um, so if there's, I, you know, if there's something that I could do to get people to change their perspective about that, it would be that we have to talk about it and we need to support it and we need to embrace it. And you just don't, you know, you don't wait till it's too late because we look at that as an after effect. And, you know, sometimes if we could be more proactive, we probably wouldn't get to some of the places that we've kind of gotten to recently. Hmm. Yeah. And that kind of gets back to the family secret. It's like Absolutely. we're this big family of America and that, yeah. that we can't have that family secret sitting over there. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and you look at some of the data and you really talk about United States being the highest. And, you know, I think the 250 plus mass shootings this year alone, you know, um, and you look at other countries in comparison and they don't, well, they also talk about mental health. They're a little bit more open to it. Um, they discuss it and um, they have preventative is part of healthcare and insurance, you know, in some of their plans. Um, and here it's selective. Selena Stockley is the executive director of Serenity View an inpatient recovery program for co-occurring addiction and mental health issues located north of Dallas, Texas. You can find out more about Serenity View's staff and their approach to treatment at serenityview.com. To check out more episodes of this podcast and find all kinds of other resources and tools from Meadows Behavioral Healthcare, visit beyondtheorypodcast.com. Finally, thank you for listening. And I hope you'll join us again next time for another episode of Beyond Theory.